Hello and welcome to Lecture 2 of Periodic Motion in Phys 1104. This lecture is mostly about simple harmonic motion, which we met in the last lecture, and in particular we're going to look at a few ideas which will help us write down the position as a function of time in the next lecture. In the last lecture we defined simple harmonic motion as motion which results from a linear restoring force, or equivalently motion with a sinusoidal position versus time. And an important property of these motions is that they have a period which is independent of the amplitude, which is true for simple harmonic motion, but not for other oscillations. The prototype of simple harmonic motion is the mass on a spring, but any system which undergoes simple harmonic motion is what we call a simple harmonic oscillator. And many systems are simple harmonic oscillators aside from the mass on the spring, especially when they're at small amplitudes, and we saw some examples of those. There turns out to be a rather special and close relationship between simple harmonic motion and uniform circular motion. If you set up an object that's rotating so that it's in line with an object in simple harmonic motion and arrange for their periods to match and for the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion to be the same as the radius of the circular motion, then if you shine a light across them, you'll find that their shadows follow each other. This is a difficult demonstration to do, but you can find videos of it. Here's a demonstration of this using a post on a rotating wheel and a pendulum, and you can see that the shadow of the post on the rotating wheel is doing a fairly good job of following the motion of the pendulum. Here's another demonstration of it using a ball on a rotating arm and another ball on a spring, and again you can see that they follow each other fairly well. This close relationship between uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion is going to be useful to us, because simple harmonic motion is a little bit complicated. It's motion with a non-uniform acceleration, but this relationship lets us relate it to uniform circular motion, which at least is motion with a constant speed. So we imagine an object which is undergoing uniform circular motion next to our simple harmonic oscillator that we're trying to analyze, and it moves around a thing that we call the reference circle. The reference circle is lined up with the motion of the oscillator so that its center is even with the equilibrium position, and its radius matches the amplitude of the simple harmonic oscillator's motion. And in particular, there's an arrow that points from the center of the circle out to this imaginary object. We call this arrow the phaser. Uh, no, we call it the phasor. And the angle it makes is called the phase. We can write the position of the simple harmonic oscillator in terms of the phase, because this distance here is a sine theta, and so, so is the position of the simple harmonic oscillator. Many vibrations are simple harmonic motion, but most are not, and so you might be wondering why we would spend all of this effort on understanding simple harmonic motion if it doesn't describe most vibrations. Well, the reason is something called Fourier's theorem, which is sort of abstract, but I'm going to give you a quick idea of it, just so you understand why simple harmonic motion is so important. Fourier's theorem says that all periodic motions can be expressed as a sum of simple harmonic motions. Well, to show you what that means, I need a motion that is not simple harmonic motion, and so I'm going to use some really fun math combined with my cello to show you that. I'd love to play you a tune on my cello, but I'm just going to play you one note. <laughs> What I would like to do is show you the motion of the string directly, but the string itself is too small for a motion sensor to detect well, and it's also moving too fast. But we can do almost as well, because we can record the sound from the string, and the sound waves have the same shape as the position versus time of the string. So here is the recorded sound from that string being played. I'll call this the signal. 
Notice that it's periodic. There is one period, but it's most definitely not a sinusoidal wave. The period turns out to be 10.2 milliseconds, which corresponds to a frequency of 98 hertz. That's good, that means my cello is in tune, because 98 hertz is a G. We can take the signal and do something called Fourier analysis with it. I can't go into what Fourier analysis is, the math is too hard for this course, but what we get out are what are called mode amplitudes, and to understand what they are, remember that Fourier's theorem is saying that we can express the signal as a sum of simple harmonic motions. So. There is a first harmonic that we call F1, that's also called the fundamental frequency, and that's at the 98 hertz that matches the period of the signal. But then what Fourier's theorem tells us is that we have to add a whole lot of other simple harmonic motions at other frequencies, frequencies that are integer multiples of the first harmonic. So there's the second harmonic at twice the fundamental frequency, the third harmonic, the fourth harmonic, and so on. If that's seeming a little confusing, I think doing the reverse process will clarify it. We now have some mode amplitudes, and those are telling us the sizes of a bunch of different simple harmonic oscillations that we need to add together to get our original signal. And so the first harmonic is telling us that there's a, a, a simple harmonic motion with a frequency of 98 hertz that looks like this. The second one looks like this. Notice it's at twice the frequency and has a different amplitude. There's the third one, and there are more. Now we do what's called Fourier synthesis, which is adding together all of these different modes to recover the signal. If I just add together the first two modes, I get a signal that looks like this, which isn't a great match for the original signal. Adding the third mode in hasn't improved things much, but by the time I add in the fourth and fifth modes, now I'm getting a signal that looks a fair bit like my original signal. To fully recover the whole signal, I would have to add a lot more modes. This is math beyond what we can do in this course, but the reason I'm showing you this is that this is the basis of all signal processing and of spectroscopy. So the electrical engineers in the course will be very interested in signal processing, and the chemists will be interested in spectroscopy. This is also the basis of how we record and store digital music, and lots of other things as well. So let's come back to our cart and spring, and I want to remind you of a bunch of things that we already know, so that I can introduce a new piece of terminology. The force that the, that the spring exerts on the cart is zero when the cart is at its equilibrium position, which is x equals zero with this choice of axes. And its x component is positive when x is less than zero, and the x component of the force is negative when x is greater than zero. And we know from Hooke's law that the function of the force versus position is linear. So all of this is just telling us that the force versus position graph looks like this, or in other words it's Hooke's law where, because we're talking about the force on the cart, we need to remember the negative sign and there's a location of dynamic equilibrium, and the force is a restoring force, so it always points back to there. Well, that means that for the cart, at this location, if you disturb it a little bit, either way, it's always pushed back towards this location. It's stable here. You can't get it to go away from here very easily. And so we call a place like this, where forces act to restore the system to this point, a stable equilibrium. Well now let's consider a more complicated situation where there's some set of non-dissipative forces acting on some object, and the vector sum of forces gives an x component that looks like this. And this looks like the sort of thing you encounter in advanced chemistry courses for interatomic forces and things like that. So where is, the, where is this system at equilibrium? In other words, where is the sum of the forces zero? Well, we can see three places, and I'm labeling them x1, x2, and anywhere beyond the point x3. 
and let's think about what the system does around these places. So we know that to the left of x1, the sum of forces points to the right. And in between x1 and x2, it points to the left. And from x2 to x3, it points right. And beyond x3, the sum of forces is zero. Well, that means that near x1, if you push this thing either way from x1, the forces tend to push it back towards x1. And so once again, that's a stable equilibrium, like the cart and spring. But look at x2. x2 is quite different. If you disturb this system from x2, the forces are going to push it farther away. And so you might be able to get it to rest at x2, but if you give it even the slightest nudge, it'll go zooming away from x2. And so we call that an unstable equilibrium. Anywhere beyond x3, the system just doesn't accelerate. So whatever velocity it has, it'll maintain that velocity, and we call this a neutral equilibrium. Now I want to look more closely at this point x1, which is a stable equilibrium. Think about the tangent line to the force versus position curve there. We know that if we zoom in enough, then the function of force versus position will approach its tangent line. That's one of the things calculus tells you, right? If you zoom in enough on a continuous function, then the function looks just like its tangent line. But that means in the vicinity of that point, this force versus position function looks just like the force versus position for a cart on a spring. And we know how a cart on spring behaves. It's a simple harmonic oscillator. And so this is telling us that for any system, as long as you do small displacements about a stable equilibrium, the system will execute simple harmonic motion. Well, that's what we've seen. That's exactly what's going on with the ball rolling around in the bowl or with the pendulum. There's a stable equilibrium at the bottom of the bowl for the ball in the bowl and hanging straight down for the pendulum. And so now we see why they execute simple harmonic motion when they're near enough to their equilibrium points. The final thing I want to do is connect this with something we saw way back in the unit on interactions. At that time, we saw that in an isolated system with non-dissipative forces, the sum of forces points towards locations of lower potential energy. So now think about around x1. If you go to either side of x1, the force points towards x1, which means that must be the lowest potential energy in that vicinity. And so that's what a stable equilibrium looks like on a potential energy versus position graph. It's a minimum. Similarly, if you go to either side of x2, the forces point away from x2, and so x2 must be a location of maximum potential energy. And out beyond x3, where the force is zero, that's just telling us, since the force doesn't point either way, neither way is downhill in u, and so the slope of the potential energy must be zero out there. So just to illustrate that, here's a skater on a rather interesting looking track. And we know that her gravitational potential energy is high when she's up high and low when she's down low. And so that means this is a minimum in potential energy. And so this is a location of stable equilibrium. And so is this. But this is a point of maximum potential energy, and so this would be an unstable equilibrium. So what that means fundamentally is that while for large oscillations her motion is very complicated, if I were to just pick her up and put her down near this stable equilibrium, she oscillates back and forth. And if we were to analyze that motion, we would find that it's approximately simple harmonic motion. And the same if I put her down over here. That would be approximately simple harmonic motion. But this is an unstable equilibrium. I can try and get her to stay there, but in fact it's really difficult because if she's even disturbed the slightest bit from that point, she'll start accelerating away from it.